Right, so let's just start with how you started with theatre, how you, how you got into playwriting and what were the opportunities, what was the road? Well, I, I used to write um, f fiction when I was a little kid, mm. um, but around the age of 11 my, my parents started taking me to the theatre and this is in the 70s and mm. so it was the Nimrod and, and um, the Philip Street Theatre and I just loved it. I mean, you know, the, the, the Nimrod, which is now the Stables Theatre where Griffin is, you could touch the actors yeah, yeah. if you reached out. And um, I remember there was a, a production of Tooth of Crime and Reg Livermore got really sweaty and spun at one point and his sweat just hit me in the <laughs> face. And I thought, oh, I want to do this yeah. when I grow up. Yeah. And it was interesting because I didn't want to be one of the people on the stage. I wanted to be the person who decided what they said. Mm -hmm. And I, and I went home and, and said to my parents, I'd like to be a playwright. And they said, well, then you'll need a typewriter. So they gave me a, a portable typewriter for my 12th birthday no. present. And it's one of those things where looking back on it, I think it was an amazing thing for them to do really, like to take a 12 year old seriously and say, and not laugh at you for saying mm. you want to be a playwright. And in fact, give you the one tool that was available in, in the ancient <laughs> times, which was a typewriter. It was, you know, it was really extraordinary that they did that. Mm. And so I'd bash away and write these plays. And With the old carbons and so on? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. And, and I would I'd go and see lots of theatre and I loved it all. And this was a time when, when, you know, it was David Williamson and John Romerall and Alex Buzo and Dorothy Hewitt and, you know, and going to see The Chapel Perilous mm. and knowing that you could be a female Australian playwright mm. was, you know, like it was absolutely one of these things on the table that you could be when you grew up. Mm, mm. Um, and I used to borrow copies of currency plays from the Parramatta City Library. And I had this little thing where I used to borrow them repeatedly so that the librarians would think there's a lot of call for these <laughs> and they'd get more. I, I, looking back again, I think they probably realised it was the same little kid, the yeah. same little 13 year old girl borrowing them all the time. But I, yes, I borrowed all of them. Well, it's a public service you were performing. It, I, yeah. That's what I was attempting to do. <laughs> so, so I just used to bash away writing plays. And, and, uh, and when I was 15, I put one of those plays in an envelope with a letter that said, addressed to John Bell. Mm. And it said, Dear Mr. Bell, I am 15. I would like to be a playwright when I grow up. Can you read this play and tell me if I have any talent or if I'm wasting my time completely? Yours sincerely, Deborah. And I sent this off, and for six months nothing happened, mm. which was good training for how the theatre works. Yeah. And well, you know, Tom. <laughs> yes, um, and uh, but then he rang me up, and I went in and had a meeting at, at um, what was now the Belvoir Street site mm -hmm. of Nimrod. And um, and he was very kind, and and again very respectful. When you think I was fifteen, mm. you know. Mm. Um, and just after that, I wrote another play that I submitted to the Australian National Playwrights Conference, which is, did the same, the same sort of work as Playwriting Australia now does. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that was selected for workshopping. Oh, wow. Without them knowing how old I was, which was, um, which was kind of um, satisfying. Yeah. And so um, in my first year of uni, when I was 17, I went to Canberra, and, uh, where I was already at uni. And, um, and so they did these two weeks of workshopping, mm. number of plays, and it was, it was kind of mind blowing because there were all these people who had been my idols. Mm. Um, you know, I loved the Legend of King O'Malley, and there was Bob Ellis shuffling around drunkenly, yeah. Yeah. propositioning <laughs> everyone. Um, you know, and, and Jackie Weaver was in the cast of my of my play. Wow, at sixteen, it's extraordinary. It's been yeah. all downhill from there. <laughs> um, and it was. Um, I don't know that I quite made the most of it. I think I was mm. a little bit overwhelmed. Mm. Um, and that play was sold to ABC Radio. So I made my first professional money at 17. Wow. Um, uh, which was possibly not a great thing in the, because I think it maybe sets up this idea that there's a trajectory. Mm. And of course, it, it doesn't work like that. No, yeah. Um, but, uh, but I think it probably helped that I started when I was so young, mm. I didn't, I was too naive to understand that it wasn't what people did. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I just kind of marched around. I was very dogged. You know, yeah. I wrote a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, oh, uh, 
I remember DAGs would have been, that was fairly early, wasn't it? Yes, so I, I that was commissioned by Canberra Youth Theatre, so they commissioned mm. me to write a play for their company. And that was, what, was that while you were still at uni? Or? Uh, no, I'd finished uni by then. I, I, fi I did an, an English honours degree at uni and wrote my thesis on Measure for Measure mm. and, um, and did as much playwriting stuff as I could. And I wrote radio plays all through uni. I partly supported myself through uni writing radio. Um, and um, not long after uni, um, Cambridge, I went to the film school for a year, sorry. I mm. went to the Australian Film and TV School and did the screenwriting course for a year. Mm. And, then, and then Canberra Youth Theatre asked me to write a play. And, uh, and so I wrote Dags. And, uh, and so it had to be for a cast of six and in a certain age group. And it was quite good to have the, um, the limits of that. Mm. So some of the things in Dags, if anyone is familiar with it, the use of the dummies was because they didn't have enough cast to yeah. crowd scenes. <laughs> so we did the dummies, which actually are kind of fun in their own mm. terms and mm. you can have fun with them and they can make a thematic point actually. Mm. Mm. So sometimes um, those sort of limits um, are quite a nice little creative spur. Mm. Um, and Canberra Youth Theatre didn't like the play. The actors were all very serious young insects who wanted to do <laughs> plays about, you know, people self-immolating on stage. Yeah. So, <laughs> so they, they, they thought it was a ball all a bit beneath them. Yeah. But once they got in front of an audience, um, they, they discovered that they liked it. Yeah, it was a massive hit, I remember. And, yeah. uh, and, uh, and so that play was, was very good to me. Mm. So I, I think by the time it went on, I was 24. Mm -hmm. Mm. So, you know, a veteran by then. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yeah, so th and that play still gets produced yeah. around the place. And it's weird, it's slightly embarrassing to me because it's, you know, I wrote it a long time ago and, yeah. And there's some clunkiness in it that makes me cringe. Yeah. But I kind of think it, there's a kind of innocence about it that comes from it having been written by someone young. So oh, you, don't, very, you don't mess with that. It's I thematically think. very, you know, you, nothing. I mean, everything around, well, the details change, but the inner life of I that guess play so. never yeah. changes, does I mean, it? anyway, yeah. so uh, you just have to kind of smile and say thank you and, and not, <laughs> not be too embarrassed by it. <laughs> And then, so, when, where does Sweet Road fit? It's quite a lot, a lot, a lot time long later than yes. Then. So, yeah. so, so for 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 the next twenty years, I, or well not twenty years, the next ten or fifteen years, I wrote a mixture of um, TV drama. I always I wrote TV drama from from my twenty early twenties on. Mm. Um, um, and but I used to write theatre in between, and and I started writing children's novels in my late twenties. So. I was kind of always doing jumping between those three, mm. um, which was very satisfying, and, and and they're still sort of how I run my my writing life now. Mm. Um, and there'd been a few plays in between. Um, um, Gary's House mm. had been on, um, um, and then I wrote. I'm just trying to think when I actually wrote Sweet Road. I probably wrote it in the late '90s, but as with yeah. all my plays, it took a long time to persuade someone to put it on. Mm. Um, you know, there's very few slots for mm. Australian plays, mm. and at any one time, certain things are in fashion, certain people are in power. And yeah. You know, there's really a handful of people who decide what goes on. Mm. Um, and then sometimes the ground shifts slightly, and you slip through. Mm. Um, and with Sweet Road, it was very peculiar that after years of bashing on doors trying to get it on, um, after Gary's house had been quite a big hit, really, but anyway. Um, I ended up having two productions pretty much simultaneously. Yeah. There was, a, there was a, the, the, the Playbox State Theatre one and then the, yeah, the so, Ensemble. So, yeah, so Playbox in Melbourne, w w for people would now probably know it as Malt House. Malt House Theatre, yeah. Um, mm. and, but in those days, Playbox did an all-Australian slate. Mm. Um, so it was a Playbox South Australian Theatre Company co-pro. Mm. And at the same time, the Ensemble mm. did it. Mm. Um, and and uh, there was a three-week gap. Mm. I mean, like th they overlapped for most of the season, which was quite a bizarre. Yeah. So I was flying between um, um, Melbourne and Sydney and talking to two different casts yeah. and, uh, and doing rewrites for one production and then trying to, to kind of persuade the other, the other cast that, no, no, I think this rewrite is good. Let's do this. And... Mm. and um, that was very peculiar. Did they end up in doing slightly different versions? No, uh, no, no. In the end, um, that's a it's a play that changed a lot 
in rehearsal. I mean, I generally rewrite a bit in rehearsal anyway, mm. but it's a play that probably changed more in rehearsal than anything I've ever done. Mm. Partly because there's so many little moving parts in it. Mm. Because it's not one linear story. I mean, I mean, the play is linear, but but there's not one story. Yeah, yeah. There's lots of different options of how, of what which bit you tell when. Mm. Um, I fiddled around with it, and mm. when you see a play on stage, suddenly all sorts of things become apparent, and you think, "What sort of idiot was I <laughs> yes. not to have realised this sooner?" It's a shocking thing, isn't it? But with Sweet Road, I even made a massive change to the scene order three weeks into the run in Melbourne. Wow. It was a, ch it was a change that the director, Aubrey Mellor, had, had suggested and I had resisted. Mm. I had some sort of notion in my head of how the story should be. And I realised that he was right. Mm. And, I, and I rewrote it. And I remember I faxed, this is again, this is the year 2000, so <laughs> olden days. And I faxed. Um, the, the changes to the cast and they came in an hour early before their call and went over it and did it that night and wow. you just think you feel so grateful yeah. that actors will will take the risk of that really yeah, yeah. Um, and the Sydney one was still in rehearsal mm. so I ran back to Sydney and went into the rehearsal room and I said I think we should change it like this and the actors were nervous because they sort of got their heads around the way it was mm. and I said let's just read it Let's just do it once mm. and hopefully you'll feel that it's better. Mm. And luckily they did. They did. Oh yeah. Good. <laughs> so, um, but we were fiddling with the end and all sorts of things um, right through all the, every preview and mm. anyway. <laughs> what suggested it to you as a, a, as a, a piece? I, I, I'm just trying to remember because it's such a long time ago. It, it was, I think the idea of the road journey is very potent thing for Australians. Yeah. I think I think we have I don't know if the, I don't know if this is everyone, but it's certainly people of my generation. We have a real sense of the map mm. and the coast and the great dividing range and then the great, you know, expanse of land beyond mm. that. Mm. And I think that's a very powerful thing in our minds and mm. and you know, the the road trip is big and is, is it's a big part of the Australian um, culture, but I also think it's, you know, it's classic storytelling. So mm. the idea that you, you throw a whole lot of people onto, onto a road trip at this pivotal point in their lives mm. when they're all kind of broken open in some way mm. and then you have them connect and see what happens mm. um, was appealing to me. And so I constructed the flood, uh, the flooded um, salt pans and the flooded rivers to trap them mm. together. Mm. Um, I love myth yeah. and folk tale. Yeah. So um, although the surface of my plays is you know colloquial and mm. very sort of earthy and down to earth. The underpinning for me is always quite mythic ideas, mm. Mm. even if it's not apparent. Like with peach season. With peach yeah. season yeah. too yeah. is is a myth, yeah. but um, um, uh, yeah, I, I, it's something that I that I'm humble about because I think that there there are reasons why certain story shapes have survived for thousands of years across every culture because. Mm. You know, human beings vibrate to certain story mm. structures, and mm. you should be grateful for them and humbly take them and use mm. them, mm. rather mm. than than think that you don't need all that stuff, all yeah. that classic stuff, because we need it. Yeah. Um, so, it, I was, it, in terms of the the characters, because they're so vivid, you know, that kind of terribly sad Michael who's lost the child. Oh, I know. And, I yeah. love them all. Yeah, they're beautiful, I and, love and them. Andy and Carla. You know, the the, the kind of Poor woman who's with the little kids and the hopeless bloody husband who's very very charming. Yes, which is a, <laughs> <laughs> which is a great favourite of yours as a character. In play, I know. Um, it, it, it they did, did they sort of I don't know like did they announce themselves to you or did you sit down and really go now who do I need to I, yeah, I've got a yes. structure here who do I need to fill it or which um, way around did that go? Andy and Carla were the, as you say they're they're a kind of type of character that I love mm. those kind of strident gorgeous banshee women yeah. and those kind of adorable <laughs> hopeless grown ups with ADD <laughs> yeah. really um, and and the and, and and somebody who who's optimistic in a way that's dangerous mm. and someone who's and, and a partner who's forced to be their kind of foil and yeah. protector and gets gets forced into the position of being the negative one the warning one 
So they were a little bit like other, and I think I, I, I partly wanted to revisit some characters from Gary's house. Yeah, they are. But they so are. I, but so I made them, I made them a different kind of pair. Mm. So they, so they, they're kind of. It was more that I, I love being with those characters, and I think there's lots of fun you can have with them, and and lots of ideas about how people approach life that I think is very interesting. Mm. I think pretty early on I had that of the woman who's driving away from yeah. her life. It's Joe, yeah. And yeah. shedding, I, I'm very, I've always been very intrigued by the idea of shedding your identity. Mm. Um, and then I think the Michael character, the, the man whose child has died, oh, spoiler, um, <laughs> he, um, I think I was thinking, what would make somebody so wretched mm. that they would want to wander in the wilderness? Mm. See, I feel, it's, just, it's, so, it's so funny, isn't it? I feel, it's quite a physical thing for me, story. Like I feel mm. quite chilly mm. and shaken up. How sad is that? Mm, mm, All mm. these years on, I still mm. feel quite upset about them. Um, so well, thinking, who, who would want to be driving around the desert? Who would be so full of guilt and grief that they would want to drive around the desert? But who would we want to go home? I mm. wanted one of the characters to go home because mm. I think the idea of going home is a very potent idea. Mm. So I think we understand why he's there, but we want him to go home. Mm. Mm. So... Which he does. Which he does. <laughs> um, um, and then, and then I the grey nomad idea for Frank seemed yeah, obvious, yeah. and I, I think I, again that's a real figure of mine—the kind of mm. adorable father character yeah. who maybe maybe based on my dad. <laughs> um, just might be. So, it's just a little bit. Um, so uh, look, there's something. It's interesting because I, I was thinking the other day about something else. I don't, I don't generally have villains mm. in my work. If there are villains, they're often off stage. They're, mm. they're Joe's hopeless joke husband, or or the malevolent force in the world is cancer or mm. a car accident. Mm. It's not or bad f- misfortune. Misfortune, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not um, it's not an evil character, and it's not that I don't believe there are evil people in the world, but I guess they interest me less than than characters who are like most of us, which is people who are trying our best mm. and stuffing up mm. and hurting each other by accident, mm. not because we're evil. Mm. And so if you if you grab a collection of characters and you give them all maybe some dark thing that they're bouncing away from, and then you chuck them together, stuff happens, mm. Mm. I think, and, and, and I'm interested in that. Mm. So, I mean, maybe this play is more obviously you get a group of disparate people and throw them together um, because of the because of the the, the premise, mm. um, but I think it's a, something I do all the time, really. Mm. Yeah, because it's very, it's a stra- it's a sort of very um, overt theatrical device, you know. So just people yes. are driving, which you can't do sure. in, in the theatre, you, you know. Well, the, the, the um, when when Aubrey Mellor first read the play, he said, "Oh, darling, you've written this marvelous play, but it's absolutely unstageable." <laughs> And I thought, well, is it? I mean, you know, I mean, I did, you know, roll a car, flood a salt lake. Mm. There, are, there are children and a dog. I mean, <laughs> I, I, that was another thing. I, I, I thought it was sad the way children are such an incredible presence in the world. And you very rarely see them on stage, mm. especially in Australia. Yeah. I think in England they put children in things. But in Australia you never see children, mm. really. Very rare, yeah. And I wanted children to be a factor for mm. um, one lot of characters. So I thought the only way to do it is to have them be inferred. Yeah. For the for the which works terribly well. It's Look, of... it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, it's one of those things where on the page it may not be apparent, but I think every time I've seen a production of it, it generally works. Mm. That the the existence of the dog and the existence of the small children yeah. is absolutely created. Those actors endow a bit of empty space with the presence of a child, mm. and it's almost funnier that you can't see them. Yeah. Yeah. That, that we imagine what these naughty little kids are doing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so I get to show, because I find parenting endlessly fascinating. I mean, a lot of my plays are actually about parenting, mm. surrogate parenting mm. of various sorts. And it, I get the chance to, to, to write about what it's like to be a mother like Carla mm. and what a powerful thing that is. <laughs> are you a mother like Carla? Well, <laughs> well I... I, um, I don't know if anyone is familiar with the, the old sitcom Roseanne, which was a big mm. favourite of mine. It's actually a very witty, fantastic show. And I realised watching it again recently that my parenting is based on Roseanne. <laughs> but That's... my children are relatively mentally healthy now, so I think it, it must have worked out okay. Yeah. Um, 
but the, the, I like the idea of the, the ferociously loving mother, mm. you know, who's got all her faults, but my God, you don't question for a minute that she loves those kids. Mm. So to see that on stage, sorry, I'm bouncing around here. Maybe that is partly too, as a female writer, when you are looking to classic stories and myths for powerful figures, it's mm. very hard to find female ones. Yeah. There are a few, yeah. but there aren't many. So what you tend to do is either take a male archetype and do it as a female, which can work. Mm. But I didn't feel that because of because of the bloody patriarchy, Tom, <laughs> there isn't there isn't a great yeah. wealth of mythic and classic storytelling about powerful females that are about being a mother. I mean, apart from Medea, who Me, kills her kids. I was going to say, right? <laughs> um, so that's why I've written about the Demeter and Persephone myths, and mm. that's why um, I, I've tried to make this sort of lioness mother. Yeah. Because I think we have to kind of cr start creating some, since we weren't handed them. Yeah. By the culture. And it is like I mean that the, the particularly Carla in that play is a kind of a, I associate her a bit with um, say Gwen in a way. Right. Um, yes. 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 And it is some and 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 so sort of certain other I, I can't immediately some of them, but she's a recognisable type now in Australian storytelling. Yes. That 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 woman who's you know really kind of as you were saying trying to cope with the hopeless husband and the difficult kids, the one who's trying to yes. keep everything together and you the know, smart very, mouth and the yeah. you know like I think that's a I mean I think it's partly a, a type in Australian writing, but it's because they're out there. Yeah, we I should say are out there. <laughs> <laughs> smart mouth, fancy women <laughs> yes. such as yourself. Yes, yes. <laughs> and Dorothy Hewitt, the dear departed. <laughs> <laughs>